do a song called Love is Gonna Get Ya. <laughs> <laughs> Song. Yeah. <laughs> That's your theme song, I thought. <laughs> Every day. night and you know that was really a, a pretty rapid dismantling movie uh, <laughs> when you consider you know the very first scene of his he's kind of coming to in this train and he's just like what is this what is this like he's just seeing this situation for the first time ever and he's got his eyes wide open he's quite surprised and and that doesn't even begin to give a hint of all the surprises uh, that he will have uh, coming up. And one thing I, I noticed about that movie is uh, there were little glimmers, you know, the, the woman across from him and her smile and just beaming at him from time to time, but he really didn't really get many uh, pep talks. Uh, through the whole thing. It was just like going down the rabbit hole and and he was just trying to hang in there with his willingness the best that he could. And in, in that sense, I think that was a little bit uncharacteristic. It made it quite a striking movie and you could, you could definitely relate to him as he was going through these things because he had to keep letting go and letting go and letting go and calling upon his willingness but the thing I think with the Course in Miracles and the thing with the spiritual path is I find that there's lots of pep talks sprinkled in uh, throughout the Course. 
And on the pathway, I know in my, my own life, I didn't always have uh, so many mighty companions around me, but I did have a really strong, clear connection with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and they gave me lots of pep talks, and they played me lots of music, uh, and they, uh, you could say, serenaded me, uh, and I felt like I was serenaded quite a lot. And I don't think you can underestimate how important that is. Just from watching that movie last night, you know, and putting yourself kind of in, in his shoes, it's quite daunting. <laughs> it's almost like, wow. He went from surprise to disoriented and then to more disoriented, and it's just been a tech. Here comes another loop of disorientation. And then in the end, it just turned into the happy dream. And imagine how that would have been with an each eight-minute clip, you know, somewhere in the clip, there was Helena over in the corner going, Love is gonna get you, love is gonna get you, if you like. You know, imagine how helpful that would have been. Like, even to be able to hear that message in the middle of all that dori disorientation. In fact, that, that would have helped him really hang in there. He just had to muster every bit of willingness he could get to hang in there with this. And, and at times, you know, I think that there was that one point where he was quite, it was quite dark and suicidal, and his tank reflected that. You know, it got very cold, it got very dark, it got very isolating, and that was a reflection of, of him kind of diving into that to death wish, you know, like, I just want to die. Uh, and, you know, we've gone through those experiences when it's gotten really intense in this lifetime where we've felt, you know, I just want to crawl under a rock somewhere or just get out of here, uh, turn it off, uh, cut it off somehow. It's too much, it's too intense. And, you know, he had his scene too. But I think the best thing about this journey is that, that we are entitled to miracles and we are have to stay open to helpers coming our way. We can't really overestimate the value of mighty companions. And one time somebody did ask me, you know, what really are mighty companions? And really, they're almost like angelic in the sense that they're these nurturing, loving reflections of thoughts that make you feel like you're at home, that you're with family, that you're cared for, that no matter how intense the dismantling is, is happening, you know, you have people around you that really, really care about you, that will pause in their day, that will take a stop and just say, oh, let me just be with you, let me just hold your hand, let me hold you, let me be still with you and, and remember what this is all about. Let me be there as a reminder. So, again, here we go again. We're back into practicalities, uh, those morning sessions. What do we got cooking today on the, on the burner? <laughs> I need a pep talk in a certain area. I guess it's been kind of popping up. I know I looked at it quite deeply last year, and it was uh, created a lot of fear, but it seems to have have been coming back in <clears throat> lately, and um, I don't want it, want it to turn into a wildfire, but that's that's the idea that, <clears throat> you know, if I follow this all the way out, am I going to be taken care of? It, it, it appears as if my, um, my finances are, are dwindling at a much more rapid rate than, you know, I had, I had um, initially anticipated, so... Um, you know, my mind starts jumping out there. Okay, I, instead of having two and a half years worth of funds, I, now it's at this rate, it's going to be a little over a year or whatever, you know, whatever the ego is saying. And so <clears throat> it's starting to create a little bit of fear. And then Vince offered me a job. You know, it's like every contractor that we've ever had here that I've worked <laughs> with has offered me a job. So um, it just seems to be like um, a witness to the idea that, you know, this is, it's going to, end eventually, um, and then you'll have to go back out, you know, into the world. And, um, yeah, there's, um, it's just, it, and I'm 
not saying I'm not willing to do that if that's the guidance, but it just there's still fear around that. So I need a pep talk. And no. and I know like one thing that like really has popped up and and had blown me away the first time I met you was your talk about um, CEOs can't can't be enlightened. You can't be a CEO and be enlightened. And I know that that, that really blew me away and kind of pushed me in this direction. So, pep talk, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, uh, yesterday, I believe it was, I got an email and it was a CEO contacting me and wanting to do some consultations <laughs> with me. <laughs> Wants to set up half an hour session consultations, so, uh, so yeah, we'll we'll see how that all plays out. But well, I think the best starting point for the pep talk is what we were just talking about yesterday, when we were talking about the idea of responsibility and what are what is my responsibility, and um, part of our training and conditioning as we move through, you know, childhood, and we come into young adulthood, and then we come into uh, what the world would call becoming a, a mature, functioning adult uh, citizen, uh, a contributor to the uh, gross national product. I talked about that too the other day. Uh, that's, that's a common theme, um, and it's very deeply ingrained. I mean, if you if you actually looked at the United States and the, and the whole idea of the, the workers and the, the producers, uh, we still have like a little pocket of uh, people that are really like working their jobs and collecting their pay and paying their taxes and kind of driving the system. And there's a lot of people that are, that are not earning enough money to be taxed at all by the system, and then we have a, the welfare population, and then we have the homeless population and everything. Out of the whole pie, there's the ones that are like on the top that are kind of like, people are like, thank God for them. They're driving the whole thing. They're, care they're pulling the wagon for the rest of these freeloaders. Uh, and they're, thank God, at least we've got the ones up there that are doing that. And and there's a lot of conditioning in that, you know, it's like, as far as productivity and, and so forth, that, that is like a baseline of, of, of worth and importance and so on and so forth. And, you know, I think people go through phases with that where at some point in their life they start to feel that the pull of that, how, how seemingly important that is on earth in society, regardless of the societies. It, it varies by cultures. Some cultures have many more people that, like I've been to Colombia and some of the places where the majority of the people live on $2 a day. You know, that's, for most Americans, that's like, $2 a day, what could I, how could I live on $2 a day? What could, what does, what's it gonna get me, you know? But they actually do. Uh, the majority of the population uh, lives on $2 a day in Colombia. But so there's this push, and also there's this sense of keeping an eye on the bank account, uh, savings and expenditures, and uh, making sure that it, that it doesn't get too lopsided and you don't end up in the debit side. And many people are on the debit side and, and feel like, well, I'm, just, I'm, I'm like an indentured servant of the system, or I'm just going to be working for X number of years just to pay back whatever mortgages, loans, student loans, and debts, and so on and so forth. And then you start to get to the teachings of A Course in Miracles, and when you really start to dive down, what you realize is that the whole Course is predicated on God dependence. Uh, that actually, dependency is a, is a very negative uh, word in this world. It's a very, very, very negative connotation. And it's kind of striking that once you work with the Course and you start to go deeper with where is Jesus taking me with this whole thing, He's actually taking you right into the core of dependency, what He would probably refer to more as God dependency, what St. Francis, Mother Teresa has called divine providence. Because 
on the one end of the spectrum is kind of this sense of um, of being dependent on others, on the system, whether it's welfare or other people, uh, who's the sugar daddy, who's who's paying the bills, da 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 da. And then on the other hand of that continuum is the sense of independence, where we hear this thing called financial independence. Uh, you know how how are you? Uh, oh, the the very very best of financial independence would be we could call independently wealthy or independently set in terms of finances, where there's no seeming care or concern. Although if you interview the people that are that are independently wealthy, they're working like hell <laughs> to keep it. <laughs> to not lose it. They're, they're stressed out as much as the ones that are wondering where the next uh, dollar is going to come from. They're both. It's high stress on both levels. And the reason it's high stress is because it's, it's very much person-based dependency and it's a, it's the, the scarcity principle is played out on both ends of the spectrum. And as long as you're on that spectrum, there really is no peace of mind. Uh, you know, if you're trying to protect it or you're trying to get it, uh, there's just going to be no peace of mind. In fact, there will only be peace of mind when you become God-dependent. And what, how is that different from what I've been saying all along is, is that the sole function is to accept the atonement, and the way to do that is to learn to listen and follow the Holy Spirit, which is to be God-dependent. Um, so, the goal is not to become personally independent, personally financially set, uh, personally to be sitting pretty uh, on your nest egg or whatever people would say that's just at that end, that that won't get you into the kingdom of heaven either. It's, it's highly valued in this world, you know, it's, it's seen as extremely mature, extremely well conditioned, well-disciplined, prudent, it's a good word, wow, that you've done so well, prudent everything, easier for the, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because the, the, the dependency on the, on the systems of the world, on the belief in economics, on supply and demand and everything, is is really strong over there. And on the other end, it's more, there's a lot of fear around this extreme scarcity and how am I going to make it through the day. It's like survival at the other end. It's really intense stress at either level. So in my life, with, with 10 years of university and, and lots of people coaching me on what I could do with my life and what I could make of myself and everything, I was kind of pondering this whole continuum and really praying for guidance because I didn't want to pour my heart and my soul and my energy into something that would bear no fruits. And accumulated wealth and possessions and riches bear no fruits. Ultimately, we discover this. Um, we have people like, even like Marilyn Monroe, I use the example, you know, wealth, fame, possessions, sex appeal, famous husbands, you know, Arthur Miller, Joe DeMont, I mean, ding, 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 as far as hitting the standards of what the world would call good, you know, uh, you've made it. She was ringing the bell, <coughs> ringing the bell strong over there, and extremely depressed, and in the end, suicidal. Uh, we don't have to follow down Marilyn Monroe's road. We can learn from her experiences that that is not going to bring it home. We're not going to have the experience that way. And also, playing it out the other way with extreme scarcity, deprivation, so on and so forth, um, it's a state of mind. You know, there are a lot of mystics and saints that just, you can see it in their glowing eyes. And uh, basically all that they seem to have with them is like a little G-string. <laughs> you know, uh, it's so, so there's so little in terms of possession, but it wouldn't really matter because if they had the attachment to the G-string, it would be hell. <laughs> just, just that would be enough to 
to keep them in health. So part of what this journey is, is, is a journey into authentic divine providence. And when people ask me about divine providence, I tell them it's a state of mind and it's not that some people live in divine providence and others don't. You know, like, oh, well, we look through history and we've got, okay, St. Francis, there we go. He's our divine providence person and Mother Teresa. And you can pick your saints and mystics. And you can say, oh, okay, we got a handful here of examples of those that actually lived in divine providence. And then we've got trillions of examples of people that have no clue of what divine providence is, and we're not living in divine providence, but actually everyone is living in divine providence. Whether they are aware of it or not, the power of God is what sustains. The power of God, the Holy Spirit is the great sustainer in our mind, offering us the lessons that we need, waking us up, teaching us how to forgive, offering us, as I said yesterday, everything that we have need of, for as long as we have need of it, and renewing it for as long as we have need of it. But, he would not have us linger in time. He knows our home is eternity. He's not going to just like be pumping stuff at us, saying, okay, you're, you're going to keep surviving, surviving. He wants us to awaken and remember divine love, not to merely exist in illusions. What would that even mean, existing in illusions? We're back to being dead, if we, if we think that that's the benchmark. So, so it is a walk of trust, and the way that you can really gauge where you are in that is again, you know, Jesus says, the one right use of judgment is how do you feel. To the extent that there's stress, it wouldn't matter if there's lots of investments and and money in the bank and savings and they're stressed, or there's no money in the bank, no savings, no investments, and they're stressed. Stress is stress. If you're hitting either end of that continuum or anywhere on that continuum, then that's an indicator that, that there's a need for the development of trust. Trust in the voice for God within. Trust in the, the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction. And that's the only thing that uh, takes you completely out of the stress, and takes you right into the peace. When you get involved in the miracle, and you become, we'll say, habitually miracle-minded, then the conditions of the world that, that people watch, those ticker tapes of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the NASDAQ, you know, the price of of gold, the price of precious metals, you know, different commodities and bonds and blah, 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 blah. It's amazing how many little human eyes are watching those things every day, you know, because they actually believe that, that that's their life savings, that that's, that that's the most important thing in life. There's even a Course in Miracles uh, teacher one time recently when the stock market crashed and he was up talking to a group of us and he was just like saying, you know, I'm hurting. He, I think I, he told the percentage of his entire life savings, which I guess he had in different investments and IRAs and so forth. It was just wiped away when the stock market just went boom. You know, one day he, he seemed to have this much accumulated assets and whammo, bammo. You know, it was like whoosh, was just like sliced in half, or worse. Um, and, he, and he said, and I'm not alone. <laughs> There's a lot of other Americans that, you know, to the mystic, it's like, what book are you reading? <laughs> what book are you reading? You can't sincerely believe that, that, that Jesus would promote anything like an investment. I mean, when you read those things, you know, the world I see holds nothing that I want. How does that fit with the portfolio? Uh, how does that fit with assets and investments and all this and this? It doesn't. Um, and, and Jesus is not advocating poverty. I know sometimes 
And throughout history, you know, even the, the, the convents and the monasteries, they sometimes would have these vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And, um, you know, even the Beatitudes, talking about blessed are the poor, I think that is, again, an error, only to the sense that, that what Jesus is saying is poverty is ego thinking. And true wealth and abundance is, is right-mindedness. And from that definition we were talking about, that, that is purely thinking in a state of mind. It doesn't have anything to do with what seems to be the form, or accumulated possessions, and all that other stuff. It's, it's purely based on a state of mind. And when you open up to that right-mindedness, and you actually do the mind training, and your trust grows, and your faith grows, and confidence in that, that guidance, then you, of course, are rich beyond any definition of wealth in this world. Because that's a wealth that can never be taken away from you. You know, you know store not your treasures up on earth, you know, where moths and thieves can steal, you know, store your treasures up in heaven. He's saying, put all your investment in your mind training and your, your right mindedness. Put all your investment in miracles, so much so that you become miracle minded. And the more you do that, this idea of, of savings, this idea of, of financial backing will just fade and fade and fade from awareness. So that it, you will go through a day without having a thought about that. It'll be the farthest thing from watching the ticker. <laughs> It'll be like the ticker is fades and fades and fades away. And the, and the conditions and the cycles of the world, you know, which there's so many books written and there's so many, you know, money line and they now have cable channels that just pretty much watch the ticker all day. Breaking news! <laughs> The ticker's up, the ticker's down. Okay, let's get the experts in. What is it? Well, what about this stock? And they're like, well, tell us the fact, you know. It's just like amazing to watch a, a cable television channel dedicated only to the ticker. <laughs> you know, it's like, ah. It just shows you the absurdity of it all. But as you start to go deeper into this, you start to realize that everything that you seem to need is provided. And you only come into that awareness through experience. You know, it's not like we read it in a book. We just, we can't just read the words divine providence and go, oh, okay, good. <laughs> we have to actually be thoroughly convinced of divine providence. Otherwise, it's like sentimentally, oh, wouldn't that be nice? God takes care of me. Uh, goes against all my conditioning of everything I've been taught <laughs> in the whole universe, but, but God takes care. The universe takes care. We're not taught that. We're taught the universe is a hostile place. It's kill or be killed. It's survival of the fittest, you know. We've been taught something far, far different than divine providence, and we've got layers of it there that have to be washed away. So, it's only going to be through experiences. Uh, and, like, even with this community, this isn't like a community that studies the secret and that's driven on prosperity. <laughs> and neither is this community driven by asceticism tendencies. You know, where we're all going to end up with the, the plow <laughs> in the flinty soil down in the canyon. Okay, <laughs> Ma, do we have any turnips today? To <laughs> nope, just some uh, couple pieces of lettuce there to munch on. <laughs> You want. You know, it's <laughs> it's like we're we're not going to the ascetic route either, where where we somehow make some kind of a of an uh, an ego ideal out of simplicity and form. We're going for mind training. We're going for peace of mind. We're letting everything be used for that mind training for peace of mind, and we're not driven by some kind of ideals of like. Okay, well, we've had enough of this uh, food and this and this. We're going to join a co-op, or we're going to be 
we're going to live off the land and we're not going to ever buy anything from a grocery store anymore or you know we're going to forget the uh, gasoline that's no that's too dependent on the system you know we're going to we're going to dig our own wells and you know and pump our own oil and refine it and you know it in independent like become completely independent in the world's terms or completely autonomous in the world's terms or go to extremes of asceticism you know because that's not the teachings of a course in miracles in the workbook of a course in miracles jesus says many have tried to renounce the world while still believing in it. That's what asceticism is. To actually try to say, I'm holier than thou, because look how simply I'm living. Not like you over there. Uh, you're caught in the system and I'm not, and I'm living a simple life. And when you define the form as simple, you've missed it again. Um, Simplicity is a state of mind. It's it's not a form. And so I'm very well aware of this from the from my work with Jesus in the Course. And I've also taken the time to to look at a lot of different communities that have existed throughout history and and communities that exist around the world today, different co-ops, different systems and so forth. And it really comes down to to a devotion to the mind training. Um, even communities where they share uh, property or share food, food co-ops and so on and so forth, they still get into the same ego conflicts around jealousies and and it, if it doesn't come up in one area, it will pop up in another area. Um, until the ego is raised up to the light and truly exposed as nothing, you it won't matter whether you're living in a nuclear family, or you're living like a hermit, or you're living in a community, or whatever, it's going to rear its head. And it's going to, it's going to pr be projected out into the world in some way. You know, we think of these, these kind of stoic individualists, um, like, uh, like uh, the movie Moby Dick, you know, out there, and now it's like the man is battling a whale, you know, or you have couples fighting and clashing and arguing. Uh, I think of the, the show, the sitcom, Married with Children. <laughs> Ed, and wasn't it Ed? And you know, it's just like wham, bam. It was like, and the laugh track, ha 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 ha, as they psychologically just bash each other. You know, it's supposed to be kind of funny. <laughs> I don't think it was really funny. I didn't laugh. Uh, and then that you have communities and groups that get into all kinds of hierarchies and strange kind of notions and and what's sacred and oh this is sacred this and the sacred uh, flower and the sacred salt and sacred river and you know it's the, the course is just so beautiful it's like who we are our divinity is sacred but there's nothing sacred in form so let's not get in holy cow Batman and you know <laughs> think that anything is sacred. You know, we've got really good metaphysics and mind training to to show us don't don't fall off into any kind of specialness which will not content you. You know, it will it will evaporate and be gone. So, you know, I think there's a strong context and people are sharing these experiences of this being a very vibrant, honest, open, direct, loving community and that is only a reflection of mind training. You know, you can't even perceive that unless you know somewhere in your heart what that feels like. You know, you can't even recognize it unless you've already got to a point of some sense of mind training, some level of mind training to be able to even recognize it. And um, yeah, I would just say that that whole pep talk is just like a, an assurance of just have faith and trust in the direction and movement of all of this, and which which is really all we can put our faith in. We can't really look to form and try to find gauges of you know how am I doing? How am I doing? Am I am I secure yet? <laughs> do I do I have enough 
when is enough enough and you know all those kind of questions but just really have faith in the in the mind training that's the answer thank you yeah um this is a little bit unfinished business from last night about money but i'm having an experience of running a company based on extending love and diminishing fear and it's totally beautiful and a um, for me has turned into a spiritual community while we're in the world and while we're in the middle of capitalism and participating um, and so you know, I, I get bothered when I hear people being afraid of being in the world in this way because I'm living that possibility right now. And, and kind of my journey about money has, you know, I lived kind of all my life in lack or a feeling of lack. And um, grew up kind of feeling lack. There was never enough money. And um, my husband and I own a business. And during the 2000 recession, dot-com bomb, IT bomb, followed by 9-11, we closed offices and, you know, we're just really on the verge of kind of going under. And I started studying the course. And I was given a lot of responsibilities that I didn't even want. And, you know, in my case, it was, it was a situation of I kind of couldn't leave. I had to stay. And so I had to transform that situation. And so I just started, you know, I had, a, I had fear of employees. I had fear of customers. And so, just gradually practicing, practicing the Course, I mean, every day I was in fear, and I would just say, you know, every time I felt fear, how can I love them? You know, how can I love them? And it's been kind of a 10-year journey, and, and also during that time, that, that year, we had a just a terrible lawsuit, so it was like everything was kind of coming down, and I started doing a walk of atonement every day, because for the first time in my life, I could not believe the future would be better. I believed that it was a very good possibility the future would be bleak, and so I started living in the day, you know, this is all I've got is today. Um, and, you know, it, it's turned into a, like, our employees feel like they are in love. And, and they, they want the same thing in their family. So they take their practices that, that really, today, there are so many high business programs going on, you know, like John Mackey, Conscious Capitalism, that I just want to give people kind of a another lifeline, I guess, that there are businesses that are, that are trying to practice diminishing fear and having an an environment of love. And what's so funny is, you know, like I don't feel like I'm competing with anybody and and yet we're we're very successful. And um you know, so anyway, I just want to put that out there. I I would like to take away some of the fear of, you know, what if I do run out of money and 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 go get a job, you know, because I feel like in work, you know, I 
feel like like my work is my spiritual practice, my my marriage is my spiritual practice. It's not coming here and this is my spiritual practice. It's my spiritual practice is with everyone and everywhere that I am. And you know, you take it into the world um, in a way that just ordinary average people can understand. You know, that it's not scary and it's not woo-woo and it's lo- not loopy and bald heads and robes, you know. It, it's just love. That's all it is. It's just love. Yes. You're, you did a one-on-one with Lisa and pretty much what you're describing is that's that's kind of how her life went and, and uh, with the staffing company and growth and enormous growth and Course in Miracles actually practiced uh, God written into the bylaws of the company, uh, joy extending out, radiating to the employees, to the families of the employees, to the people, the vendors. It's like a ripple effect and so on and so forth. And and certainly it ties in a little bit to what we were talking about, even with the, the secret and the power of the mind and, and this idea that um, if you align with God, and you open up to the spirit of love, which just wants to radiate and ripple out to everything and everyone, then when you come into that alignment, you will have more and more of the experience of abundance. And and that old feeling of lack, Lisa was actually on food stamps at one point in her life and and had, you know, faced a lot of conditions which we would call more extreme lack, and then to be We'll say the CEO of a company or the owner of a company, and and in which love is being practiced. So those are all very very helpful symbols and steps. And then as you go much deeper, it's like the journey up the ladder of prayer. We were talking about, you know, from lack and need to Father, what is your will for me? Is it's a it's a steep climb. It's a big long ladder. And so, where you're describing but it... do you believe that God's will for me is to be doing this? Then, that's what it feels like to me. Well, you, everyone's always at the right place at the right time. So, there's nobody, there's no beggar that's out of place. There's no um, uh, dictator out of place. There's, there's nothing in, in the state of divine order. All things are working together for good, and as Jesus says, there's no exception. As people have asked me the question, though, can you be a CEO and be enlightened? I say, absolutely not. And I'll, I'll actually meet with them and spend time with them and, and really go into it, you know, deep, like not just a surface kind of thing. But, but what the Course is about, and what Buddhism is about, and what all authentic spiritualities are about, is emptying the mind of the contents of consciousness. In other words, love is a word that gets thrown around. Love of children, love of family, love of partners and spouses and so forth. But we have to first come to an admission that that if you talk to human beings, they they have their loving moments and they have their downtimes. Uh, they have a roller coaster ride, an emotional roller coaster ride. Um, I've had people come in and and to tell me, you know, I think it's possible really to be really happy and successful. And and I mean really successful as the world judges it and really happy. And I say, really? You really believe that? And they say, yeah, I really believe it. And I said, okay, you go bring me that person. Uh, and one guy, I was think I was in Michigan, he said, yeah, I think there's a picture uh, for the Atlanta Braves, and he's won the Cy Young Award, and he's got a beautiful family and everything, and I think he's happy. I said, what's his name? And he said, Greg Maddox. I said, well, you go get Greg Maddox, and let's sit down and talk to Greg Maddox. When you sit down with anybody on the planet, I don't care if it's <coughs> Obama or Marion Williamson or whatever, if you really go down to the core of things, and you follow them on a daily basis, you know, you're going to find them going through their ups and downs, emotionally. Uh, because why? Because the mind is so deep. 
the mind is a deep well as long as there's anything unconscious that's out of awareness then happiness is not a reality it's just it's a roller coaster ride so what's so beautiful is when you really start to be honest and take a look at that honesty is consistency and what I had to do in my life was I had to start to realize that until the emotion or the experience is consistent then it's not really it like we can't we can talk about happiness but until happiness is a constant state then all that means is there's an unawareness of happiness it doesn't mean that by glimmering it and getting glimpses of it that you know what the state is so what's so beautiful is these teachings are very very uncompromising but but enlightenment and self-realization is is the goal in fact the ancient Greeks had it you know when they said know thyself and that self is a state of just pristine mind now when you look at the the way that things play out that's exactly how miracles happen in other words miracles are very practical and they are meant to be transferred and extended so so there's no compartmentalizing and saying well I'm gonna be this way in my family or this way in my business or this way in my community and so on and so forth what you start to realize is that the only way that you can come to consistent happiness I mean consistent constant happiness is what the Course says you must bring the illusions to the truth the illusions meaning every belief every thought every concept that you hold concepts of debit and credit concepts of supply and demand concepts of everything that, that we would consider down to the fabric of every concept of time and space has to be brought to the truth can you bring a course of miracles into business well can you bring the truth into illusion no can you bring a course in miracles into interpersonal relationships in the end no because you can't bring the truth into the illusion can you bring a course in miracles into society no uh, because in the end society is an egoic construct God didn't create societies God didn't create businesses God didn't create interpersonal relationships and what's so beautiful is as you work with the course the Spirit will work with you right where your belief system is so again you're you're at the right place at the right time it's like the, the course isn't about making anything wrong it's a, the course is about taking us to right mindedness and then as we go deeper into right mindedness we realize that this is a very very uncompromising thought system it it doesn't mix a little bit of this with a little bit of that it doesn't try to mix truth with illusion it doesn't try to mix light with darkness it's actually a path of bringing the darkness to the light and when you follow that out which is the basic premise of the Course in Miracles and you keep doing it um, you will find as you move along into higher and higher states of consciousness that you simply reach points where you receive the guidance which is always about not compromising and taking it all the way it will transcend every concept without exception and and that's what this is about so for me it was like you you end up having a total redefinition of success uh, to what Jesus's definitions are uh, success is peace of mind but I'm to, saying I have peace of mind within that situation and I don't see any difference from that and and this community has houses it has you know this form here people cook meals together yeah. um, I know that there's the commitment to you know no private thought but you can also be committed to honesty you know with others in a in a work situation yeah to to an extent I mean we have a, a friend of ours that volunteers named Paige and some people know that 
Paige is like an accountant, and she works at, over in Salt Lake City and everything, and and she has been coming here a lot and practicing no people pleasing, no private thoughts, and so she at one point was made the head of her accounting department. So she just thought, hey guys, come on, this, this is really good stuff, this is really healing stuff. Uh, and she did a talk to them all of us. We're gonna, since I'm the head of the accounting department now, we're gonna institute a little bit of no people pleasing and no private thoughts. They were terrified, uh, absolutely terrified. But she still, just with her presence, as you do you know, with your staff and, and so on and so forth, you can, of course, you're always working on the mind training, and those are basic principles of, of honesty. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who, who live that integrity, and they bring it, and they extend that with everything, whether it's a church, a business, their neighbor, the child that's riding the bike down the street, they practice with that. And what you'll find is that Integrity goes very deep, and that honesty is more than honesty of words. It's an honesty and integrity of mind. And so, what we do is we work with everyone who comes here to start to realize that many, many people who come have, have been working the Course, or whatever their spirituality is. It, it could be anything. They, maybe they just try to live an honest life, and they don't have any kind of big theological beliefs, but they have a, just live an honest life. And progressively, as you do work it, and you do the spiritual practice, you do get happier and happier. Where it's all heading is into a state of constant um, happiness. And, and that seems to be in this world very rare. Um, you know, I've done travels around in many countries and everything, and people, the what reason they're so riveted at going de very deep into the mind is because they're very, they do have a calling towards that love, uh, towards that unconditional love. And then the deeper they go with it, they do start to become more aware of where they're compromising. And that's really what the authentic journey is about. And it's not really about the form. Um, it's more about coming into a state of non-judgment about the form. So it's the, it's the purpose underneath. It's never about the form, um, you know, we, Malfrey brought some of those questions up about, well, people still do this, wear makeup, or do this, and this, and this, and this, and we had to take that whole starting point and say, well, it's not really, we can't draw conclusions, definitely, by based on the form about anything, but we can come more and more to that sense of, of integrity, and honesty, and consistency in, in our state of mind. And the question about, can a CEO become enlightened? Well, I, I will be counseling with a CEO uh, next week, <laughs> after I finished here. And, but well, the s I, I, I know. Uh, let me just, let me just uh, connect with one thing, and then I won't uh, you know, belabor this, because I'm totally with you. I totally agree. And there may be a time when, um, you know, I want to leave that, and, and I'm impelled to do something away from that. Um, but I, I think one of the things in, uh, um, that I'm connecting to with what you're saying is that, like, David Hawkins does these levels of consciousness, and he says, like, people that are running things, just to be in that situation... Um, and be able to handle it, they're like at this level. And so if they're like at this level, they, it's just not compatible. It's, it's this level is higher than that. And so, you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna be effective even, or want to be there. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's, it's like, no one can pray beyond what they can can comprehend, and and no one can project themselves farther than they are. So there are a lot of steps, like we were talking about, and and we could say leadership positions and so on and so forth offer tremendous opportunities. Uh, for example, uh, when people get involved, for example, with, with companies or team sports or whatever, 
there's enormous opportunities to collaborate to communicate just no different than if you were in a church or some other kind of social institution what's the what is the fabric of the ego that's underneath business that's underneath most churches that's underneath countries and families it's competition uh i don't feel i'm competing yes i don't feel competitive yeah and and to the extent that you don't that's beautiful in fact we could say that the ego is the belief in competition so to the extent that there's any kind of illness i mean a lot of times people will say you know i i want to just be loving and and respectful and trusting with every human being i meet whether it's with a business transaction or saying hi to somebody on the subway or saying hi to somebody there on the street what you find is in order to go into that true experience of love it's it's taking the idea of competition and raising it to the light where it will disappear so again we're back to bring the illusion competition you know to the light so so competition you might say is is a belief and it's something that jesus says in the course never underestimate the need to be vigilant against the idea of competition that's one of his lines from the course now we're not talking about just getting to a state of mind where it comes into mind sometimes or it's in mind not in mind sometimes but it's like letting go of that now that what that does is it brings you into what i was talking about when chris asked the question about divine providence the divine providence can only give there is no there is no reciprocity in divine providence that's the law of love uh, business whether you look at any variation of business and we've got kind of all different kinds of variations and have been practiced throughout history but but a core fundamental belief system underneath of business is reciprocity i agree and when you move deeper and deeper into divine providence which i call mysticism it literally just transcends that entirely and every little step that's taken in that direction practicing with families and and in businesses and so on and so forth is helpful so it's all i'm saying is it's a it's a very very deep journey of mind training and and to the extent that you like you say you do not feel competitive that is spectacular because love is not competitive love does not compare there is no competition in love and you might say that that's part of that purification miracles are everyone's right but purification is necessary so that's the process that's going on if you went around the room you would find that to various seeming degrees that the people are in that process um you know there are those that are company owners there are those that are company workers there are those that maybe don't identify themselves either really so much as an employee or an, an owner or an employer but even as they move through the day as they're doing their their chores and tasks or whatever you know if there's any amount or there's any degree of of competition a belief in competition the goal is to be free of that so in that sense of course that's that's what we're all joined in that same process and there's no judgment of where you seem to be in that process it's just that that the state of mind that is free of reciprocity and competition is an absolute state it's it's not a matter of degree got it can i just ask one more thing yes um last night you talked about giving money and you know i felt i spent so many years of my life feeling a lack of money and so now that i have money and i'm not worried about money and i don't you know i don't worry about the ticker tape and all that stuff i don't worry about money 
when when i see that somebody it appears needs money you know i like to give money and it's totally free no strings attached you know i don't i don't want anything out of it and so you know talk to me about that last night i felt like you were kind of making that bad and um you know i feel good about it it makes me feel good and happy um and it seems to fill human needs and and at times take away stress and worry so yeah we can we could simplify it by saying that that we everything everything about the course is about about guidance and right mindedness with the holy spirit and then letting go of of the ego so we could say just the act of giving money is kind of like it doesn't it really doesn't we can't even make a comment on that positively or negatively but we can say what the purpose underneath the giving of the money is is extremely important the giving of the money eh, you know it's almost like it's totally neutral to the holy spirit uh, the holy spirit sees the world as neutral so you know giving money would be something that would be neutral but the purpose if it's guided by the holy spirit versus being guided by the ego would be a big difference now for example like when i met lisa she had gone from her life of lack to a life of what the world calls success and abundance and she was using words like you money is not an issue for me money is no concern well actually the more we got to come together the more time we spent together we were able to get underneath that you know giving lots of money to lots of people they were showing up at christmas waiting for their next wad and so on and so forth and then emotions were running high and so on and so forth and if if there's any shred of giving money that has the guilt motive involved in it whether you're conscious of it or if it's unconscious it's it's the ego uh and the whole thing again is to be purged and be freed up from the ego motives it does, there's nothing right or wrong about giving money but if there's any a sense of of giving money for an ulterior motive that's under there that motive has to get purged uh, in order to be happy you could never be happy without that so i was using an extreme example last night uh which is jesus talking about uh uh number 7 of his 10 characteristics generosity the teacher of god does not want anything he cannot give away what would he want it for he could only lose because of it well jesus has quite a lot to say about this idea of of giving he speaks a lot about giving in the course and he speaks a lot about possession and he says when you give a physical possession you divide its ownership so it wouldn't matter whether you were giving a 100 dollar bill or you were giving a house or you were giving a rose when you give a physical possession which money is a physical possession you divide its ownership if you give somebody 100 dollars then it comes out of your bank account as as a debit and they receive it as a credit that's just the way of the world uh when you give a physical possession you divide its ownership if you give a house and you say i'm going to give you this house then the deed goes from one name into another if you say i'll share this house with you i will give you half of this house then the the deed goes in both names and each person has a half of it so every time something is given in form Jesus is saying he says it right in the course when you give a physical possession you divide its ownership divide is cut you have you have less through the giving now he's saying god does not give that way uh when god gives like in creation when god creates christ christ has everything that god has not part of it not I don't half feel of it. less when i give it yeah well that's good In other words, if you don't feel less when you're giving, then if you are truly guided by the Holy Spirit in that giving, why would you feel less? You would feel the sense of of joy. What that is is I will call it stewardship. You are a steward. Uh 
in biblical terms, that's a steward. A steward has no investment in the forms, no investment in the money, no investment in the objects, no investment in anything. But a steward listens and follows based on the guidance of the Spirit. And there is no loss, and there is no division, and there is no lack in listening and following. So, how glorious that is. Now, if you keep practicing this out, as good of a steward, or a good as, as good of a businesswoman, we'll say as divinely guided as a businesswoman <laughs> as you can be, which is great, but businesswoman is still a concept. God didn't create businesswoman. He didn't create the world, so I tell you what, he's still calling the Holy Spirit, saying, bring the illusion of businesswoman, which is just a concept, to the truth, and be still, and know that I am God. Or a vegetarian who's like very proud of it. I haven't eaten meat, we'll say, for 30 years. I'm a really good vegetarian. I, I'm actually beyond that. I'm macrobiotic, we'll say. I, I've done, I blew past vegetarianism 15 years ago, but now I'm macrobiotic and, and I'm lactose free. I mean, I'm, I'm more than a vegetarian. I'm like, I'm the nutritionist, love me. Because I'm so there like this. That's still a concept. You know, God didn't create macrobiotics. God didn't create vegetarians. God doesn't define people by what they put in their mouth. Jesus even said that 2,000 years ago. It's not what you put in, in your mouth that defiles. It's what proceeds forth from the heart, he said. So, let's say you go and go, and you keep following the Holy Spirit, and you're a great steward, steward, you know, you're... You maybe win Businesswoman of the Year for your philanthropy and your generosity and, and the Women's Guild votes you the top uh, most kind uh, businesswoman in, in America or whatever. It doesn't matter. What I'm saying is those are all concepts. Right, and those and are the ones I don't want or, or that I'm not. I'm not any of those things. But the thing is, as we still believe in a world, like a world out there, like you started off saying, you know, I want to extend love to the world. The belief is, is there's an external world to extend it to. And granted, that's why we have A Course in Miracles, to help train our mind to start to realize that the world's not really outside of us. And it doesn't really need fixing. Uh, and it doesn't need improving. We, we may say, well, the world looks like it's kind of scarce and lacking in some ways. Well, that's just a perception. If, if I forgive it, if I release it from judgment, then I, I won't see a lacking world. I won't see any lack in the world anymore because my healed perception will show me a world of fullness, of life. Life springs up everywhere in that way. So all I'm saying is I'm just putting it all into a context that that it's beautiful, you're kind of in the flow of the miracle, great. That's what we want for everyone. Um, is it practical? Yeah, you're, you're practicing with, with your husband, you're practicing with your employees, you're practicing with your neighbors. Is that good? Of course, that's the direction we're using. And as we keep practicing more and more and more, we do come into this state of mind where we realize that that we can't really ever get anything from anybody, you know, and that's the, the goal of true giving. We're just kind of purifying our awareness of what true giving is. Is it okay to, you know, like I've just been, some real blocks have, have fallen off of me in the last three months, and I feel just very content and happy where I've been very driven, you know, uh, especially about the course previously. Mm -hmm. And I just feel very content and happy and just trusting that the next step will evolve and yeah. and I'll be guided to whatever I'm supposed to, you know, oh, yeah. be doing mm -hmm. next. So, you know, it's kind of like I don't want to push anything. I just feel really happy and content and like, you know, the next thing will happen. It's the best. The, to the extent that you feel just just content and happy, it's more like that cluelessness I was talking about. You know, you really, you don't have a sense of ambition with it. You're not trying to control it. You're not trying to direct it. That's the best, best state of mind you can be in. 
because then it was like melting butter. Uh, whatever comes to you will just flow like melting butter. It's it's not a, there's not anybody trying to guide it and direct it. Also, if in this world there are those that seem to own or possess, and there are those that don't seem to own and possess, and the ones that seem to own and possess are just have the potential for tremendous stewardship. In other words, there's nothing really to owning and possessing because the Holy Spirit's just using all these symbols anyway. You know, the ego can divide it up into those that have and those that don't, but the Holy Spirit's like, oh, come on. It's just a bunch of images, and I'm just going to use them for the benefit of everyone. And when you don't have an investment, then you can truly teach everyone where their treasure is. It's when we have an agenda, it's when we have an investment, we really believe we own something or we possess something, that's when we can't really steward, because the Holy Spirit's got to wait until we get out of the way <laughs> and listen again, you know. <coughs> so it's beautiful, that's, that's like, that state of mind of, of not having concerns and cares, of feeling that, that deep sense of contentment, contentment, that's the best state of mind to be in. And in fact, that, that will lead you on. That, that is the very state that you will deepen in. It's not like going to go away and suddenly you'll be back to type A or, <laughs> you know, a driven personality. It's never going back in that direction. Can I help you? Yeah, I would love to ask you a question. Just to clarify things for yeah. me, and there are there are like three examples that comes to me, and one is um, what about this enlightened guru called Osho? He was I don't know him so well, but he seemed to be enlightened and be very rich. And then it is this saying about what does the man do who is chopping wood and whatever and after he is enlightened he goes on with doing the same thing and then you know Mira in Sweden she seemed to be for me somebody who has a consistent state of contentment and peace and she's not changing anything in her life so I just want more clarity around that because you are saying no we have there will be changes in the older form yeah that's a good one you know, that's, those are really good classic examples, too. Um, uh, before enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water. Um, those are really good examples, and, and the, I could say the helpful aspect of that saying is, is that the state of enlightenment is completely independent of what seems to be the form. For example, Jesus on the cross with blood splattering all over. I told you we watched uh, The Passion of the Christ. Uh, some people have come to me actually and have said, I, I used to think that Jesus was enlightened, but then what happened at the end of his life, uh, I, think, I think he had some guilt <laughs> there. There's an awful lot of blood splattering there, you know. He's kind of going along, it was peaceful and gentle and easy there, and there's some rifts and some some conflicts here and there, and you know, occasionally turning over some tables or you know, doing this and this. But then, oh man, it just got such a bloody mess at the end. I think he he had some lessons to learn at the end, and he certainly wasn't manifesting a very joyful ending uh, of those three years of his thing. Well, see, the you cannot interpret from the form. He had it, it was an example of reaching a state of mind. And the whole point was, teach only love, for that is what you are. That was the whole meaning of the crucifixion. But to the extent that you put any value in the form, you would miss that lesson. You'd be like, oh, wow, the love thing was going so well there, until the end. <laughs> it, then it turned into a bloody mess. Now what we learn from the Course is Jesus says, he does talk about form, and he does talk about content, and... He does talk about thinking, and he's saying that to think about murder and to actually act out murder are identical. So he's basically saying that, you know, the world would say, well, it's one thing to think about killing your husband or your wife, but it's another thing to go through with it. 
There's a big difference there. Jesus is saying, no, there isn't. They're, they're both calls for love. They're both, un, they're both something other than love. Murder is murder. Thought of murder and an action of murder are the same. That's hard for the ego mind. I mean, the ego mind's like, no, 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 you got that one wrong. Uh, the other thing he would say is, he says, what you do comes from what you think. So he's not concerned in the course with behaviors. Uh, he's concerned with changing the thoughts that you think you think, so you think with God and not try to think against God. He's always trying to focus on changing the mind and changing the belief system, changing the thoughts, but he's never focusing on the form. He doesn't talk at all about morality in the whole course. You know, there's nothing in the course about morality and there's nothing about ethics. He doesn't, he doesn't come down to giving importance to behavior. He simply says, what you do comes from what you think. Now, as you go through this transformation of consciousness, where you, your thoughts are more and more trained, and you're training your mind to be in alignment, to think only with God, to only have right-minded thoughts, it will seem as if the behavior changes, because what you do comes from what you think. And if you change away from attack thoughts and grievances to love, it will mean that your behavior will be inspired by that love. And you will give up the egoic motivated behaviors. And so there's that shift that will happen. Now, let's take a look about chop wood, carry water as if like, well, you could be doing something in form and then become enlightened and just continue on doing the same thing in form. But what we're talking about is Jesus is saying that when you align with the Holy Spirit, the only purpose that the Holy Spirit has for the body and for the world is only one thing, and that's communication. That's it. And egoic motives, Jesus divide, divides into three categories. And he tells us what the ego uses the body for. He lays it out in the Course that the Holy Spirit only uses the body for communication. That's it. And the ego uses the body for pride, for pleasure, and for attack. He comes right out and tells us. Now, if you start to purify your mind, and you start to realize that, that pride, pleasure, and attack, and egoic motive is the way that you maintain guilt, and maintain a body identification, and deny a spiritual identification, you will start to give away all beliefs and all thoughts that sponsor pride, pleasure, and attack. You see? It makes logical, divine sense. How could you listen to the ego and continue on and think that you're going to make it back to heaven? When the ego made up the world to distract you away from the kingdom of heaven within. And the ego is a different voice. It's a, it's a trickster. It's, a, it's a, an imposter. And when you follow the ego, you do not find guiltlessness. You do not find sinlessness. You simply are mired in error and sin, uh, missing the mark. Now, if what you do comes from what you think, and you start to let your mind be purified to only follow the Holy Spirit, who only has one purpose for the body, then that will mean that those behaviors, what you do, will come from what you think with the Holy Spirit. And that's going to be different than being motivated by the ego. The behavior will certainly flow from the thoughts, but as you change your thinking from thoughts of fear and guilt, pain and shame, pleasure, on in these things, to alignment with the Holy Spirit, then the behavior will flow from that new alignment. And that is the key. We're not here to try to judge the behavior. 
we're here to have an, a, a consistently peaceful, happy, joyful experience. And the only way that you have that experience is by following the Holy Spirit's one purpose and one use for everything. So, all the world is only for communication. And, of course, we're talking about communication of, inspired by the Holy Spirit. If you try to communicate ego thoughts and ego beliefs, you will simply reinforce the fragmentation the fragmentation and the separation. So, you see, this goes a bit beyond chop wood and carry water. It's a bit simplistic. <laughs> chop wood, carry water, and chop up my neighbor into pieces. Before enlightenment and after enlightenment, I chop wood, carry water, and chop up my neighbor into pieces. Ooh, tough example for whoever is saying that. The behavior is the same before enlightenment and after enlightenment. Oh yeah, huh? Chopping up my neighbor is a communication, is, is extending love, is communicating ideas of love. You see, we've just chopped up chop wood and carry water because it's a good simple metaphor, but when you start to really carry it out, it's absurd to think that Jesus would be chopping wood, carrying water, and chopping up his neighbor into a hundred pieces. So that's one thing. The other thing, what else did you ask? Was there anything else about, that was in there? About Osho. Osho, Osho, yeah. yes. Yeah. Osho I just want to say, did everyone hear? I think that's so cool. Yeah. You know, no order in form. Yeah, it's, it's the Holy Spirit. It's just perfectly clear. Yeah. For those that have the ears to hear, let them hear. It's taken a notch up from chop wood and carry water. Now, let's, the example is Osho. There, there has not been a, a mystic or a saint that is authentically reflecting that state of divinity that has any interest in possessions. I'll tell you that much. Um, love, look it up in Corinthians, love does not possess. It can't be stated any clearer. And the mind that is freed of the ego, the ego is the belief in possession. And so when you're freed of that, there is absolutely no attachment, no desire, uh, no value placed on the, the belief in possessions. So that's probably the simplest statement I can make regarding to that without getting into evaluating specific gurus and so on and so forth. I, I am willing to, when people go and explore the teachings of Osho, and then they bring the teachings of Osho to me, I am willing to look at those, those ideas, and we can then go into to an inquiry on those, but yeah, there's no judging of people or places or things like that.